Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Ken Raggio Live. Thank you for joining me for this program, and I hope you'll stay with me for the coming hour while we teach some great things from God's Word. Please, as you join me on this program today, would you click like on your Facebook timeline and let us know that you're there. Also, make a comment. Let us know at least what city, state, and country you're watching us in. And if you can, share this with your friends and let somebody else see this program, too. If you don't already follow me on Facebook, I invite you and welcome you to follow me here. And if you happen to see this on YouTube, I hope you will subscribe to my YouTube channel and click the notification button so that you will receive a notice each time we upload a new video. Since 1971, I've been preaching and teaching Bible prophecies pertaining to the last days. And there are so many things about Bible prophecies that can be very troubling, and some of them even are very frightening, especially when you begin to talk about the last seven years, about the Great Tribulation, the Mark of the Beast, and all the wars that are to come, the Battle of Armageddon, and so many other things. The teaching of Bible prophecies is something that leaves a lot of people in great consternation. It causes them a great deal of of anxiety and perhaps an unwillingness ultimately to even listen to these things to prevent being troubled. But tonight, I have good news. My subject is good news. Bible prophecies reveal great hope for believers during the Great Tribulation. It's going to be a very unique program tonight, and I hope that you will be with me and listen to what we have to say about this, because this is a different angle than perhaps you've heard me tackle this subject with before. Now, in case you don't know much about Bible prophecies, I will tell you that the, we are living, according to the scriptures, the 24th chapter of Matthew, Jesus told us that when we begin to see all the signs that you and I have seen in our day begin to come to pass, he said, this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. So the message that Jesus gave us in Matthew 24, uh, beginning verse 15, when he spoke of the he said, when you shall therefore see the abomination spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains, for then shall be great tribulation, such as never was since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor shall ever be. Now, speaking of that same event in the book of Luke, chapter 21 and 20, Jesus said, when you therefore shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, you know the desolation thereof is nigh. And in the next verses, he, he made another warning identical to what we read in Matthew 24, how that when they see these armies surrounding Jerusalem, the Jews who live in Judea should flee. Now, we've taken that and understand that to mean that the, the Jews who continue to live in the West Bank, and nowadays we call them the settlers because throughout the West Bank, we have pockets of Israelis who continue to live there, Jewish Israelis who live even among Palestinians, among Arabs and Muslims, and effectively, this prophecy says to them, when you see the man of sin, the Assyrian Muslim man of sin, walk into the Jewish temple, the third temple in Jerusalem, and commit this abomination that causes that temple to become desolate, then all the Jews that live there in the West Bank need to flee because there's gonna, this is the beginning of the Great Tribulation. Now, if we uh, go into a lot of details, which I won't do, you know and understand that the Great Tribulation lasts 42 months. 42 months. Now, you need to understand that because a lot of people have the, the impression that the Great Tribulation is the entire seven years of Daniel's prophecy, but it's not because the prophecy says that that last seven years begins when this Prince of Rome, this we now know as the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church, is going to confirm a covenant with many for one week. And so there's a seven-year covenant that's going to be agreed upon by the Roman Catholic Church, and we're looking to see that. If there's, if there's anything particularly imminent or soon coming about Bible prophecies, it is this event of the Pope confirming a covenant with many. Now, we don't know when it's going to happen, but I think every serious Bible student should be able to easily recognize when the Catholic Church finally uh, signs on to this last agreement that will last for seven years. And then the prophecy said that in the middle of that seven years, in the middle of that week, that covenant is going to be broken and this abomination is going to take place. And so that means that 42 months after the Pope confirms that covenant, this man of sin is going to stand in the temple 
And we read that in the ninth chapter of Daniel, verse 27. We also read it in, in uh, Matthew 24, 15. Jesus talks about it. And uh, that same man of sin is spoken of in 2 Thessalonians 2. The apostle Paul said concerning the coming of the Lord and our gathering together unto him that we should not be soon shaken uh, because that day will not come except there first come a falling away, which is the spiritual decline of the church, and the man of sin be revealed, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And so we're expecting to see a Muslim man of sin. And I've got a lot of videos and teachings about this on my YouTube channel, on Facebook, and also I've got articles, many articles written there uh, at KenRaggio.com. And my book, The Daniel Prophecies, goes into great detail, seven, over 700 pages of explaining these prophecies in this book, The Daniel Prophecies. So I've got a lot of teaching, and I won't try to rehash all of that here tonight. But we do know that, th that during that last seven years, the Jews are going to move into their new, newly built third temple, they're on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and they're going to start having sacrifices and oblations in that new temple. But that Assyrian man of sin, now when I call him Assyrian, I'm referring to two very critical prophecies in Isaiah chapter 14 and in Micah chapter 5. Because Isaiah 14 tells us, first of all, chapter 14 tells us about Lucifer's ambitions in the beginning, who he was the original sinner. And in later in the part of that chapter, there is prophecies concerning this Assyrian man of sin. And as it turns out, when you put all the pieces together, you realize that Satan's ambition, as it were in the early part of chapter 14, to sit in the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, that prophecy that Lucifer uh, dreamed of and hoped for and wished for back many thousands of years ago is going to be fulfilled as it were when the Assyrian man of sin walks onto that temple mount and stands there in the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. So this Assyrian and the chapter, the verses 24 to 27 there in Isaiah 14 tells us about him. He said, God said, this is the purpose that I've purposed on the whole earth, that I will destroy the Assyrian in my holy mountain. In fact, I'm going to turn to that and give you the actual reading so there'll be no doubt in your mind about exactly what is being said here. God prophesied to this Assyrian in the 14th chapter. He said, The Lord of hosts, this is verse 24, The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely as I've thought, so shall it come to pass, and as I have purposed, so shall it stand, that I will break the Assyrian in my land, and upon my mountains tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off them, and his burden depart from off their shoulders. This is the purpose that is purposed on the whole earth, and this is the hand that is stretched out upon all the nations. For the Lord of hosts hath purposed it, and who shall disannul it? Now what is the significance of this in end time prophecy? We're going to see an Assyrian, a Muslim, come into Jerusalem in the last days, and he's going to walk into the newly built third temple, in Jerusalem, and he's going to cause the Jews to get out. He's going to make it desolate. Jesus talked about that desolation in Matthew 24, 15. And Paul talked about it, as I've read to you there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And so there's another verse that corroborates what I've been telling you, and that's in Micah chapter 5. The prophet Micah also talked about this Assyrian. When, uh, if you're familiar with the prophecies that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, you know that Micah is the prophet who told us that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. And that's in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, where he said, Thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, even from everlasting. Verse 4 says, And he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide, for now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. This is, a, this is a messianic prophecy talking about Jesus Christ. But that verse, that prophecy continues in verse 5 and said, And this man shall be the peace. We're still talking about the baby born in Bethlehem, Jesus Christ. This man, Jesus, shall be the peace 
when the Assyrians shall come into our land, and when he shall tread in our palaces, then shall we raise up against him seven shepherds and eight principal men, and they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword, and the land of Nimrod in the entrances thereof. Thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land, and when he treadeth within our borders. This prophecy is telling us that Jesus Christ is going to come back and destroy an Assyrian in the holy mountain of Jerusalem, there on the temple mount in Jerusalem. That's exactly what that prophecy in Isaiah said. This is the purpose that God has purposed on the whole earth. Now, there's a great deal of significance that I'm not going to try to explain all, but the Assyrians were the first nation that took the backslidden apostate children of Israel into captivity. Way back, if you go back and remember how that when Solomon died, his kingdom was divided under Rehoboam and Jeroboam. The northern ten tribes went up to Samaria, and for several generations they lived in sin and apostasy until finally God sent the Assyrians to destroy them and judge them and carry them away captive. And now in the end of days, we're going to see the Assyrian again rise up. Now, you know, the Babylonians came and got the, north, the southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin out of Jerusalem many hundreds of years later. And now we see this additional prophecy that God said in the last days, he's going to send the Assyrians back. Now, in modern times, Assyria is modern Turkey. The territory where we see Turkey and Syria and northern Iraq and northern Iran, that's the ancient Assyrian Empire. We're going to see somebody from that region that's going to cause that sacrifice and oblation to cease in Jerusalem. Now, that's the man of sin we're looking for, and so many people call him the Antichrist. Now, make a difference between this first beast of Revelation 13 and the second beast of Revelation 13. The first beast is this Assyrian man of sin. The second beast is the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. We're going to see these two people in Revelation 19, verse 20. We know that when Jesus comes, he's going to take the beast and the false prophet, and he's going to cast them into a lake of fire there in Jerusalem. That's what the prophecy tells us. The, the beast and the false prophet are going to be destroyed by Jesus when he comes. And that collaborates with what I just read to you in Isaiah 14 and in Micah chapter 5 and 2 Thessalonians 2 and Mark 24 and Luke 21, all these are, are they're the same prophetic instant, the same prophetic events. Uh, the last 42 months, when this man of sin appears for 42 months, he's going to be on the scene. And at the end of that, Jesus is going to return at the great and final battle of Armageddon, and he's going to destroy the beast and the false prophet. Now, those are other things I could teach you about the little horn. Some of you know enough about this to know that the Bible tells us there's going to be a ten-horned beast in the last days. That's a European world, your European-based world government. We also know that three of those ten horns are going to be plucked up by another little horn, and that little horn is going to wreak havoc in Europe. And the Bible said those ten horns are going to hate the whore, which is the Roman Catholic Church, and destroy the Roman Catholic Church. And we know that this little horn is obviously going to be a Muslim because he comes from, he's, the Bible said he is, he is not like these others. He is diverse from the other ten horns. He's not a Roman Catholic. He's not a European. He comes in there and he rips up three of those major nations in the European ten horns. And, and this looks like a Muslim coming to power in the last days. And it's this Muslim man of sin that basically turns Europe into a Muslim continent is going to be this antichrist that we're looking forward and it's going to be this muslim and the pope of the roman catholic church that's going to meet jesus christ on the mountains of jerusalem when he comes now i've said all that to, to just bring to your mind and to remind you how that in the last days we're going to see this this great upheaval these great epic events these are anyway you look at it these are terrifying events these are troublesome events. These are frightening events. Just to know that you and I have lived into the last seven years is going to be a, a, an amazing, heart-stopping realization. A lot of us are going to be shocked. A lot of people are going to be 
very, 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 very disturbed when they realize that we are in the last seven years of Bible prophecies. And especially after the first half of that transpires and the third temple is built and the Jews begin to offer their sacrifices. And finally, when that man of sin slash antichrist walks into that temple, commits the abomination, leaves that new temple desolate, drives the Jews out of Jerusalem, takes over the West Bank, runs the Jews out of the West Bank, and the 144,000 Jews are sealed, and the two witnesses rise up and begin to preach for 42 months in the streets of Jerusalem. They preach the gospel. And then the Bible said the great tribulation. Jesus said when that man of sin stands up, that's when the great tribulation begins. He said, then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world at this time, nor shall ever be. So these events, and you and I are going to witness them with our very eyes. We're going to hear about them in the news. We're going to know when we see them. These things are absolutely fulfilling Bible prophecies, and they're going to be frightening events. And along with that, the Bible said, at that time, when the man of sin stands in Jerusalem and brings havoc to Jerusalem, that's it's the same period when the second beast, the Pope of the Catholic Church, introduces the mark of the beast. So for 42 months, the Bible tells us that the mark of the beast is going to be in effect. And that means that all the saints of God and the true believers are going to have to res refuse to take the mark of the beast, which is going to force true Christians off the grid. They're going to have to go into hiding. And according to the policy of the world government, those who will not take the mark of the beast will be marked to be put to death. But the Bible also tells us that if those who do take the mark of the beast will be judged eventually by Jesus Christ and sent to hell. So the mark of the beast is in and of itself a terrifying prophecy being fulfilled. And we're going to see that happen in our lifetimes. And then during that last 42 months, the Bible tells us we're going to see a great war. When you read in the book of Revelation chapter, nine about, chapter 8 and 9 about the seven trumpets, you see that we have already seen the first five of those trumpets fulfilled. And now we're waiting for the fulfillment of the sixth trumpet. And that is a great war that's going to break out on the Euphrates River. And the Bible tells us it's going to destroy one third of mankind. That's a horrible, horrific, terrifying war. Two and a half billion people are going to die according to this prophecy during that six trumpet war. Now, Ultimately, this is going to culminate with the, at the end of that seven years is when the seventh trumpet, the last trumpet is going to sound. And the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God, which is the last trump, the seventh trump, and the dead in Christ, that's the church that's in the grave, is going to rise, the Bible said, and we which are alive and remain, that's the living saints, those Christians who survived to, the, to that period, are going to be caught up in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. They're going to be changed from corruptible to incorruptible, from mortal to immortality. And the Bible said we're going to meet Jesus Christ in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, he said, comfort one another with these words. That's the end of this whole prophetic scenario, is when Jesus returns and the dead in Christ rise, the living saints rise, and then the great and final battle of Armageddon is conducted. Jesus is going to take us. The saints of God, who've just been changed from mortal to immortal, we're going to find ourselves in white robes riding white horses to the great and final battle of Armageddon with Jesus Christ. We're going to witness the destruction of that Assyrian man of sin and that Catholic false prophet. We're going to witness that with our eyes because we're going to be the part of the mighty army of Jesus Christ when he returns at the great and final battle of Armageddon. Now, I've said all that to bring you up to speed on the, the reality, the sobriety, and yea, the fearfulness, the dreadfulness of the events that lie ahead. And I'm going to be very candid with you to tell you that after almost 50 years of diligent study of these things concerning to Bible prophecies, I have to admit to you that these things also trouble me because the more I preach them, and the more I teach them and the more I understand them, the more I realize that as you and I enter into that last seven years, it is going to be the most difficult time that any humans have ever lived through. Jesus said, 
He called it great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor shall ever be. In another place, Jesus said, except those days be shortened. Are you listening? Except those days be shortened, no flesh, say that, no flesh will be saved. That's, that, that is a great, great horrifying reality that Jesus Christ taught us. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be the great tribulation of those last 42 months, which includes the mark of the beast, the great tribulation, the sixth trumpet war, and ultimately the, fa- the battle of Armageddon. Now, if that doesn't trouble you, you don't have your thinking cap on. If that doesn't alarm you, if that doesn't give you pause, if that doesn't cause some kind of consternation in your soul, then you really are not thinking. And one of the reasons why I'm even addressing this subject tonight is because I, I am more and more realizing that the things that I preach have caused a lot of people a lot of distress. And I want to address that matter of the distress that comes from knowing and understanding these Bible prophecies. Now, Jesus told his disciples in the beginning, he said, in this world you shall have tribulation. But, he said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. That's in uh, the book of John, in fact, chapter 16, verse 33. He said, these things... In fact, I'm going to back up to verse 32. He said, The hour cometh that you shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Now, when Jesus was about to be taken and crucified, Jesus gave them this warning. Jesus warned his disciples in their day that he was going to be crucified. Those 12 were about to face their personal great tribulation. And that's when Jesus comforted them by saying, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. Now that sounds ironic. That sounds even contradictory. He's just telling them that he's going to die, and they're going to be without him. But he said, In this world you shall have, he said, I'm telling you these things that you might have peace. Now, do you see the irony in him warning them that they are about to face this horrible trial and at the same time comforting them and saying, I'm telling you these things that you might have peace? In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I want to remind you that one of the first things that we know about Jesus Christ in his adult life and ministry is the fact that from the moment he appeared on the scene at the Jordan River and was baptized in water by by John the Baptist, we remember how the Holy Ghost came down upon him in the form of a dove. We know how the voice of God spoke and said, this is my beloved son. And then the Bible tells us that he was immediately led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil for 40 days. Now, there's something really amazing about that, and that is that Jesus, from the day his ministry was inaugurated, was led into a 40-day fasting and prayer trial where he met Satan face to face. You know the story, how that Satan tempted him those three times. Each time Satan challenged him, Jesus countermanded him by quoting him the Word of God and basically setting the devil in, in, in his place. And so he overcome, and that's what he, that's one of the things that Jesus had in mind when he said, "Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world." That's one of the things that that's one of the big things Jesus overcame. He overcame a personal wilderness trial, face to face with Satan. Now, every one of our trials has a different character to it. We have trials of death and sickness and disease. We have trials of financial woes. We have trials of job losses and and broken marriages and children who are in trouble. And there's a million kinds of trials and tribulations that people go through. And it is inevitable. It is inevitable. Saint or sinner. There's a scripture that says it rains on the just and it rains on the unjust. 
Trials come upon everybody, but they especially come upon the people of God because we live in a world that is dominated by Satan, the God of this world. Lucifer, Satan, that old serpent, has taken control of the principalities and powers of darkness, and they are the rulers of the darkness of this world, and they are the rulers of spiritual wickedness in high places. And that's the world that you and I live in. It's not waiting for the great tribulation. We're in that kind of an environment already. Some of you listening to me are going through a great, horrifying trial even as you're listening to me today. Some of you are facing the loss of a loved one or the death of a family member or maybe even a spouse or a child. Some of you are going through cancer and other diseases in your body. Some of you are facing great hardship. Some of you are going through great trials in your ministry and in your Christian walk with God. But I'm here to tell you, they're all the same. All of these individual tribulations... They all fall into the same category of being part of the ordained experience of every man, every man and woman of God. It is our ordained experience. God has ordained us just as surely as God ordained Jesus to be tempted in the wilderness for 40 days face to face with Satan. You and I are ordained to face our demons. We are ordained to face our trials and our tribulations. But Jesus said, be of good cheer. He said, I tell you these things that you might have peace. You remember how Jesus warned Peter? Before he went to Calvary, Jesus uh, told Peter that before the cock crows, you're going to deny me thrice. And of course, Peter didn't believe that. But Jesus knew. But that's not all Jesus said. He said, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail thee not. Now, here's what I want to tell you tonight. And this is what I'm talking about tonight because my subject is good news. Now, we tend to forget. We tend to forget. Do you know what the meaning of the word gospel is? The very word gospel comes from the Greek evangelia, evangelize. And that word evangelize means good news, to spread the good news. Listen to me. The word gospel means to spread the good news, or the gospel is the good news, and to evangelize is to spread the good news. Say it, good news. The gospel is good news. Now, I want you to wrap that around all this discussion that I've just gone through on the subject of the last seven years and the great tribulation and the mark of the beast and all the trials and tribulations that you and I are destined to go through. I want you to remember all of these hardships and trials are a part of the good news. You say, you're, you're crazy, preacher. No, sir, I'm not crazy. Because Jesus said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In the 14th chapter of John, he said, let not your heart be troubled. And I say to you today, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now that's good news. He said, let not your heart be troubled. Now I'm going to go straight to the bottom line of this, and that's Romans 8, 28, because the Apostle Paul said, For we know that all things work together for the good to them who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. When you have the call of God as such as we have, God has called us to this salvation. God has called us to this grace. He has called us to this new birth. He has given us his word, 1,200 pages of God's in eternal, infallible, inerrant word. He has called us to himself. He has said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for my yoke is easy now I want you to keep that in mind when you're going through tribulation Jesus said my yoke is easy and my burden is light you say preacher you're not making any sense if if his yoke is easy why are we going through the great tribulation and that's what I want to talk to you about 
When you and I are faced with the trials of our life, there's two ways we can approach this. We can approach these things with, with a carnal mind, or we can approach these things with the mind of Christ. Paul said, let this mind be in you which was in Christ. Now, the mind of Christ is not like you're in my mind. When you, you've got to remember that the carnal mind, the Bible said, is enmity. Enmity. And that word means hostility. Our carnal thinking is hostility against God's thinking. When Lucifer said to Adam and Eve back yonder, hath God said, he introduced contrary thinking to the mind of God. Say that, would you? Contrary thinking to the mind of God. Do you know that's what the carnal mind does? Your carnal mind and my carnal mind thinks contrary to the mind of Christ. That's why we need to put on Christ. That's the reason we need to be conformed, say it, conformed to the image of Christ. We need to have the spirit and the attitude of Christ so that when you face your trial and when you face your temptation, you're saying in your heart and you're saying in your mind, be of good cheer. Paul said in the book of Hebrews, for the joy that was set before him, for the joy that was set before Jesus Christ, for the light at the end of his tunnel, he endured the cross and despised the shame. Now, I want you to take a moment with me, and let's do a little bit of imagination about what Jesus must have had on his mind in Gethsemane. Now, we know, we know as much about Gethsemane that the Bible said, when he went to pray, he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. Now, you can only explain that by realizing that the flesh of Christ was just like our flesh. These people that teach that Jesus had divine flesh don't know what in the world they're talking about. Jesus didn't have divine flesh. He had the flesh that came out of his mother's womb, Mary. His seed was Holy Ghost seed in the womb of Mary, and it produced a baby that was altogether man and altogether God. God was in him, but the flesh was also in him. The, the human body that Jesus had was altogether like yours and mine, but the spirit in him was his father. He, he was his father embodied. Jesus is son after the flesh and father after the spirit. But the mind that was in him, the, the great perfect thing about Jesus Christ is that in all of his life, in his 33 or so years, however many years he lived, Jesus never once allowed his carnal mind to preempt the mind of God that was in him. And that's how he overcame. Jesus overcame by submitting himself to the will and the purpose of God, and he did so voluntarily. After he had sweat, as it were, great drops of blood, and after he had prayed three times in a row, if it be thy will, let this cup of suffering pass from me, the answer was ultimately no. And he finally said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine. And from that moment, he got up and he walked up. He told the boys he was done. And it was at that point when uh, Judas Iscariot and the Roman soldiers showed up to pick up Jesus. And Jesus, uh, Judas greeted Jesus with a kiss. And Jesus called him friend. <laughs> Jesus called Judas friend that night because he knew this was ordained. When Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate, Pilate tried to threaten him and say, don't you realize I, could, I have the power to kill you? And Jesus said, you don't have any power except God gave it to you. Jesus never lost the realization that he was in the will of God and that what he was doing was the will of God and that nobody really had any power over him, that, he, that what he was about to go through was ordained from the, the Bible said the Lamb of God was slain from the foundation of the world. From the day God Almighty made the heavens and the earth, Jesus Christ was slain. And Jesus knew that. He knew that. And that's what you and I need to know. Our trials are as ordained as his trials. We are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. And in the doing so, we have to be prepared to face our trials and our temptations and our tribulations. And we have to overcome them in the same order that Jesus Christ did. And the way Jesus did was to stand fast on the word of God and allow nothing but nothing to interfere with what he knew the will of God was. And there, here's, here's where we get down to the reality of this thing. For the joy 
that was set before him. When Jesus was on the cross, his body was suffering, but his spirit knew. In the end of it, he said, Father, into thy hand I commend my spirit. And he knew. He knew he had done the will of God. And three days later, his trial was over. Do you realize that? When those angels, when, when Mary and Mary Magdalene and those women went up there that next morning uh, and found that tomb, the stone at that tomb rolled back, and he, they saw those angels standing there, and one told them, he's not here. He said, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. I, I'm telling you, Jesus' trial was forever over. Jesus' trial was forever open because he was alive forevermore. He was dead, but he now lives, and the Bible says he's alive forevermore. Jesus has no more trials. When he comes back, he's coming in great power. He's coming in great glory. He's coming as the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's coming with the sword of God in his mouth, and he's going to destroy his enemies with just speaking his word. Jesus is never going to bleed again. He's never, he's never going to suffer any pain, no agony. Jesus is not going to be persecuted by anybody. Jesus is going to come as the great and final authority. And that's the kind of a thinking that you and I have to embrace, that when God has, a, God has allowed us to go through that which we ordain to go through, there is going to be great glory for the joy that is set before us. And I have, I have to believe that there was satisfaction in Jesus' soul, even on the cross. I have to believe that. I have to believe that when he was carried out of Gethsemane to uh, Caiaphas' house, when those soldiers carried him from Gethsemane to uh, Caiaphas' house, the high priest's house, Jesus had peace in his own heart. I realize he had some suffering yet to go through, but in his heart of hearts, he knew that he was doing what... In fact, he told, he told his disciples just the night before, he said, at the Last Supper, he said, uh, one of you is going to betray me. And uh, they said, who is it? He said, the one that dips the sop with me. And, and soon after that, Judas Iscariot dipped the sop. Jesus looked at him and said, what thou doest, do quickly. Jesus knew that Judas was the one that was going to betray him, and he told him to do it. He, he ordained him. He gave him a license to do it, and he said, do it quickly. Get it over with. Let's get it over with. And Jesus you have to understand, Jesus had peace about it. He had satisfaction about it. He had contentment about what he was about to suffer. And you and I need to know that. There is peace in the midst of a storm. It's like when Paul was out there on the sea for two or three days, they had faced a horrible tempest. Eurycliden, the storm, was threatening every moment to sink their ship and they were terrified they had not eaten in days they were so scared and the angel of the lord appeared to paul during that night and said uh, go ahead and eat not one soul is going to be lost and you're going to go safely to shore now he knew they were going to be shipwrecked but he knew nobody's lives was going to be lost and he told them that he said i believe that it shall be even as it was said unto me. He told, he told the men on the ship, and that's when they began to eat again. They realized once the word of the Lord came to them, they were safe. Even though the storm continued to rage, they began to eat and be satisfied because they had the word of the Lord to comfort them. Let not your heart be troubled. And I'm here to tell you that whatever trial and whatever tribulation that Almighty God has ordained for you and me to go through, there is, there is contentment to be had. There is peace. Paul said godliness with contentment is great gain. One of the most priceless, valuable lessons you will ever learn in this life is to be content with your trial, is to have peace in your trial, and to know that this trial was ordained of God. I'm here to do the will of God, and when this trial is over, there is going to be great glory. He said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And when your trial is over and when my trial is over, there's going to be a great reward. John saw that crowd that came through there. He saw an innumerable company of people in the presence of God. He said, who are these? And the angel said, these are they which came through great tribulation. They've washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. And they've loved not their lives unto the death. These were overcomers. And I hope to believe that in that crowd that John saw, I was there and that you were there. These are they which overcame. 
You're the one that will overcome. You may suffer pain. You may suffer loss. You may suffer hardship, but there's not a hardship or a loss or a trial that by the help and grace of God you cannot bear or endure. Paul said, I have learned, and you and I need to learn this, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And some say he wrote that verse while he was incarcerated in an underground cave in Rome called the Mamertine Prison. Paul understood. In fact, how many times do we see, uh, you know, when Paul and uh, Silas were imprisoned at night, they had been beaten and they had been put in shackles and chains and were locked up in a prison. And at night, the Bible said, they sang praises to God. Can you tell me how does anybody sing praises to God when you have just been beaten within an inch of your life and you've been put in chains and stocks and thrown into a prison? How do you sing unless you have the peace of God that passes all understanding? And I say to you, godliness with contentment is one of your greatest gains if you ever learn how to endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. But Paul said, none of these things move me. Whatever you have to go through. And, and here, here's, here's the, one of the other things I really want to bear down on here. And there, you know what? And what I feel in my soul right now is going to be my subject for several more programs after this. One because there, I've got so much that I feel like we need to say about this. You must understand that our hope is entirely in the Lord Jesus Christ. Can anybody tell me? Anywhere else we can go to find hope. Can you find hope in red communism of Russia or China? There's no hope in Russian Chinese communism. There, is there hope in Islam? There is no hope in Islam. Is there hope in Buddhism? There is no hope in Buddhism. Is there hope in Roman Catholicism? There is no hope in Roman Catholicism. Is there hope in atheism? There is no hope in atheism. I'm telling you the only hope to be had in this universe is the hope that is in Jesus Christ. That's why the gospel is good news. Because there is no other there is no other cause in this life that has the promised reward on the other end. Now there's a lot of people in this world that have learned how to cash in on life. There's a lot of people that have learned how to manifest what they want to manifest in this life. They've learned how to get their money, they've learned how to have their pleasures. They learn how to party and build houses and accumulate possessions. But there's a problem with that because at the end of the journey is an empty is an emptiness at the end of the journey is spiritual bankruptcy at the end of the journey is judgment the Bible said Paul said for we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ you you can get all the wealth and prosperity and success in this world and still meet God unprepared and that's not what anybody should want to do I want I want a hope that is beyond the grave I want a hope that does not dump me off in hell I want a hope that allows me and enables me to pass the judgment bar of Christ and that only hope is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ the gospel will get you through your trial the good news of Jesus Christ will get you through your trial. And there, there are supernatural components to a walk with God, so, so much so that no matter what you go through, you know there's Old Testament verses said, when you pass through the fire, it will not burn you. When you go through the flood, it will not overflow you. How many, of you, how many of you know these stories from the Bible, how that, you know, the story of Joseph, for instance. God gave Joseph a dream that he was going to be exalted above his brethren. In one, in one dream that Joseph had, he saw the sheaves of his brethren bound down to his sheaves in a field. In this other dream, he saw the sun, the moon, the stars making obeisance to his star. And so God showed him in these two allegorical dreams that he was going to be exalted above his household. But the, the temporary circumstances 
didn't seem to prove that out because once he told those dreams to his brother, they became jealous and they threw him in a pit, the Bible said, and they sold him into slavery. That seems so contrary to the purpose of God for Joseph's life. But the Bible said after he was sold into slavery, he was, he was taken up by Potiphar in the Egyptian Pharaoh's kingdom. And there in Potiphar's house, he was betrayed by Potiphar's wife. And he was sent to prison. And in prison, he suffered there. But I, I want you to look at something else. Despite this great tribulation that Joseph had to go through, Yet there are some positive elements of that that we tend not to think about. And that is, number one, even in Potiphar's house, Joseph was exalted. Potiphar made him the ruler of his household. God blessed Joseph in Potiphar's household, even up until the moment of his betrayal by Potiphar's wife. And once he was thrown into the federal penitentiary, the Egyptian prisons, the Bible said in the prison he was also exalted and he was given to be a manager over the other prisoners. So there was blessing of God in Joseph's trial. And everybody knows that at the end of the trial he was released from prison and he was exalted in Pharaoh's court and he rode the second chariot to Pharaoh. And I want you to think about that. Whatever trial it is that God has ordained you to, even while you are suffering, there are blessings to be had in the midst of your suffering. Even while you're being betrayed, there are consolations. Even while you are in prison, there are consolations. Look at the children of Israel when they were taken into Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar the king. You have these young men like Daniel. Daniel was... A young teenager, obviously, when he was taken captivity, he lived 70 years in, in Babylon and later in Persia. And all those period of time, he, he was a Jew among pagans. All, during all that time, he was confined to a very undesirable circumstance in contrast to what he believed his life should really be. But nevertheless, the Bible said God blessed and exalted Daniel so much so that he became the, pres he became the president of Babylon in the first part of his life, and in the latter part of his life, he became the president of Persia. You all know the story of the lion, Daniel in the lion's den. Even though he was thrown in the lion's den, the Bible said God Almighty shut the lion's mouths so that when the king came the next morning to check on him, he said, O king, live forever. The Lord's come and shut the lion's mouth, and I'm doing fine. And I'm telling you, and you and you, that when you go through your trial, God Almighty is going to be in your lion's den, and God Almighty is going to be in your fiery furnace. That fourth man, that angel of the Lord, was with the three Hebrew children, and the Bible said when they came out of the fire, they'd even smell like smoke. And it doesn't make any difference. If you suffer, even though they stoned the apostle Stephen to death, while he was dying, while the blood was yet flowing from his face and his, his skull and his body was hurting from the blow of those stones. The Bible said they looked on him and beheld him and his face was as the face of an angel. And he said, I see Jesus. There was glory for Stephen in his martyrdom. And I'm telling you, you and I need an expectation. And I, I want to really bear it on this for a few minutes and I'll quit. I want you and me to begin to realize and begin to expect that Almighty God is going to be with us. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. The Holy Ghost that Jesus gave us when he went into heaven, when, when Jesus was ascended into heaven, he sent his spirit back down upon us. The, the Holy Ghost is the spirit of Christ, and that is our comforter. How many of you understand that the Holy Ghost is our comforter? You, If you have the Holy Ghost, if you've been filled with the Holy Ghost like they received the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, speaking with other tongues, you have the comforter. And if you have the comforter, then you have what it takes to get through your trial. God will be there with you. And I'm here to tell you that in your great trial, if you will be faithful to God, if you will be born again and do the will of God and live a holy, godly life before him, when you go through your trial, you will not be disappointed. 
You will not be disappointed. God will be with you and you will see his glory and he will encourage you and he will lift you up and he will strengthen you and he will help you like you've never even imagined. I'm thinking how Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open to you. Do you understand what the value of that is? It doesn't make any difference what the context is that you're in. It doesn't make any difference if you're driving around in a nice car and living in a nice house or if you're living in poverty and going through the worst trial in the world. It doesn't make any difference because God is with you. He is there to comfort you. He is with you always, even to the end of the age. And he will be there in your situation. He's with you right now. He's with us right now. And if you can ask and receive and seek and find and knock and the door will be open, that's true 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. God will be with you everywhere you go through every test and every trial. God is there to help you right now in your trial. And I'm just telling you something. Your expectation and my expectation needs to be just like Jesus' expectation was when he saw the joy that set before. I want to tell you that as we go into these last days of Bible prophecies, when we get into the last seven years and ultimately into the last 42 months of great tribulation, and when we see the mark of the beast and we see the Antichrist and the false prophet and all these wicked, wicked, wicked things, and we see men and women dying on every hand and perhaps some of our own are dying, some of our own loved ones, maybe we ourselves will perish. Yet the hand of God will be there for us to visibly witness and experience. The voice of God will be speaking. The angels will be working. There will be, there will be times, I'm sure as I'm living, that even in the great tribulation that God Almighty is going to make, send provision. There's, we're going to find food in our pantries that weren't, wasn't there. We're going to find water in our water jugs that, w that was gone. We're going to find miracles of every kind. That God, God is going to transport people around miraculously. God is going to send provision and meet needs like the world has never seen because that's the way God is. Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness was only 40 days. And our trial is only 42 months in that great tribulation. And when all that's over, there's an old spiritual song that says, I'm going to lay down my sword and shield down by the riverside. And I'm going to study war no more. And John Bunyan wrote in Pilgrim's Progress how that when uh, Christian came to that river to cross the river to the other side to the celestial city he said I leave my sword and my shield to him that will have it. My marks and my scars I take with me to the other side. And with that he waded into that river and the angels greeted him on the other side. Now, I've seen people die of horrible diseases. I've watched people die in tragic circumstances. I've personally gone through a lot of trials, and I know you have too. But there's a day coming when you and I are going to cross that Jordan River to the other side, and we're going to lay down our sword and our shield, and we're going to study war no more. And that is the good news of this gospel. Believe it tonight and be saved in Jesus' name. And that's my message to you. I hope you got something good out of it. I'm going to preach a lot more on this subject. I have a lot more to say about it I didn't get to today. So we're going to deal with this again soon. May the Lord bless you and keep you and save you. If you are not ready to meet God, I tell you what the Bible says you need to do. Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 3 through 7, Marvel not, I say unto you, you must be born again. Nicodemus said, How can I do that? Must I enter into my mother's womb? He said, No, except you're born of the water and of the Spirit. You cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That's water baptism and spirit baptism. Water baptism is what the apostle Peter preached to them on the day of Pentecost. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, 
in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. When I was in Jerusalem last year, I took all my group down, as I do every year, to the southern steps of the Temple Mount. And there are those old mikvah baths where the ancient Jews used to wash themselves in pools of water before they went up to the top of the Temple Mount. They were all washed in water in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. There's a lot of people that believe that because the upper room is only about maybe three or four blocks away from that location, most people believe that that's where Peter brought those thousands that day and baptized those thousands right there in those mikvah baths in Jesus' name for the remission of their sins. And the Holy Ghost fell. And the, the Bible said there was added unto the church 3,000 that day. And I'm telling you, you and I need to follow that same pattern. Repent of our sins, be baptized in, the, in water in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and receive the Holy Ghost like they did on the day of Pentecost, speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives unto us. If you do that, you're on the right track. That's exactly what God Almighty has called you to do. Then live a godly, holy life before Him, and He's going to call us all home one of these days. Thank you for listening to me tonight. I hope you will. Follow me on all my social networks on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Also go to Amazon.com. Look up the books by Ken Radio. Search on Amazon for books by Ken Radio. There's nine great apostolic Pentecostal books here that will bless and help you. I have a special offer for those of you who'd like to pick up all these books at a discounted price, $125 for all nine books. Please check the link at the bottom of this video. You'll be able to purchase all nine books for only $125. Here's an audio disc that's got one, an hour-long sermon that teaches all the chronology of Bible prophecies. It's called, Where Are We Going? How Will We Get There? Go to my website at kenradio.com, click on the books link, and you'll see this audio here. You can order it online on my website at kenradio.com. While you're at the website, please sign up for my daily Bible studies. You'll receive four mini Bible lessons every day in one single email. You'll get an email every day. We'll go through the entire Bible, Genesis through Revelation, and you'll get a lot of blessings out of that as well. And uh, remember, keep in mind that every year we go to Israel. If you'd like to go to Israel with me, please contact me through Facebook Messenger or by email and uh, get the information about our Israel trip. And in May of 2020, we're taking a Daniel Prophecies cruise to Alaska, seven great days of cruising the Alaskan coast and teaching Bible prophecies at night. So if you're interested in that, check out my video on YouTube, my cruise video on YouTube or on Facebook, and let me know if you're interested in going to that. God bless you. Thanks again. See you next time.